Uh, all right, so we're, we're continuing. Um, so now um, we're going to have Nikola Marincic. He is currently a postdoctoral researcher at ETH Zurich, but very soon he's going to join uh, University of Florida as an assistant professor. So we welcome him very warm, warmly. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, excited to join the University of Florida, of course. Excited to see you all here and to hopefully collaborate in the future. So this lecture is not about my work. It's not about my projects. It's about my thoughts on the current challenges of AI that we face simply because uh, oh, there is too much pragmatics going on. There is currently 100 scientific papers published on AI every day. And uh, thinking about it has become kind of secondary or even much further than that. So I'm just thinking, my, my talk is about, yes, playfulness, but also like, is there a certain responsibility to take while we are playing? And yeah, we'll see also why I chose this title I think it's actually precise, although it doesn't seem like. So uh, my interest is in this relationship between architecture and information technology. And my focus is on the challenges that AI brings to our field. For me, I think that we should face these challenges through digital literacy. And we should embrace the abstractness of computation. So for me, computation is not something that belongs to computer scientists. It's simply a new avenue for us to express ourselves and to reinvent architecture in the digital. So in the first part, I will give you a short perspective on the relation between architecture and computer, uh, in computers, how it emerged and the tension that it creates and uh, certain elements that people do not often want to talk about. So what I find interesting is that architects work, whether it's a uh, theory or a building, always involves integrating a wide variety of things which la lay outside of their own area of expertise. And we can integrate incommensurable things such as light, shadow, climate, heat, sound, materials, materials, airflow, electricity, information, waste. And for more than 3,000 years, we have done it masterfully. And the architecture's ability to integrate what seems incommensurable into a coherent whole that is larger than its individual parts is something I call architectonics. On the other hand, an architectural model unifies and holds all these diverse aspects together in multiplicity of ways. And unlike in sciences, the notion of an architectural model was never formalized. The involved architectonics that we work with as architects had always been too complex to be described by some kind of axiomatic theory. Thus, the notion of an architectural model was developed in writing. We have treatises from Vitruvius, Alberti, Palladio, Boulet, Semper, Corbusier, Denise Scott Brown, Venturi, Kohlhaas, Eisenman. Okay, how do computers enter this stage? So the development of digital computers, the actual machines in the 50s, evoked a unification across all fields of knowledge. What used to be modeling, turned into computational modeling. And what happened to architecture? Well, my position is that the elusive, complex architectural model got fractured. Architecture's uh, representational aspect became digitalized. For example, CAD paradigm utilized computer graphics only to mimic the traditional design methods within a simulation of Euclidean space. But almost every other architectural aspect, like thinking, theory, stories, inspirations, all of the nice things that we see today in these talks, they stayed away from computers for way too long. It was simply not possible at, the at that time and that stage of computation to capture things that we can do today. And my question about the all is how to reunify it, how to rethink the architectural model in the digital. And to do this, I think it's very helpful to, to understand how do we actually, how are modeling position is positioned within a larger scope of modeling. I will start now with something which is for me a very striking thing which no one ever talks about. 
uh, it's about the notion of what the truth is. So until the 19th century, there was a common belief that the axioms of logic and geometry, the things that you see on both sides, were the truth about our world. So geometry was about, and, and logic were at the time, so the truth was also a, a notion that you that you can model with, so it was a formal notion, and at the same time it was believed that it's also a truth about our world. So that these things kind of are unifying the, the, the what is real and what is formal. And then, uh, because of, of this stability that, it, that these things had for thousands of years, in the 19th century, all the sciences just wished to be described in a certain, in a similar way, to be grounded in something as stable, as strong, um, as geometry and logic. And then something happened, which is a small thing, but it, it made a crack in this whole uh, idea. So in 1829, uh, Lobachevsky, mathematician, he developed a geometry by appropriating this, for example, first four uh, postulates of Euclid. And then the fifth postulate, which was a little bit difficult, it was not clear whether, how do you derive this postulate? Because you cannot really prove it from the, from the others, and stuff like that. So he only did a simple thing. He switched the truthfulness of the fifth postulate to be, instead of doing a true statement, he made it a false statement. Yeah? From this small change, he got something which is called a hyperbolic geometry. And this geometry, it describes a world which cannot be observed empirically. And on the other side, from the logical standpoint, it is as good as Euclid's. Yeah? So it's completely constructed in the same way, true or false. I mean, this is something that, uh, as logic is concerned, it doesn't matter. Uh, and this is how the idea of, about what the truth means started falling apart. Because it was a separation between as a truth, as something that we believe is a part of the reality, and the truth, which is something that we model with, that, that is a kind of uh, formal notion. So it started simply breaking with such an important idea. Therefore, as truthfulness was not useful in this regard, there was a need for a new idea, for a new concept that could be used to prove the trustworthiness of theories and of knowledge systems. And this idea was consistency. And we can recognize two schools that uh, were interested in establishing consistency that had completely different attitudes. So they wanted the same thing, but had completely different attitude. And I think this still today holds the same, the same division, still holds, holds today. It, it, this tension is there. The first group is about like Farr, Craig, and Russell. They wanted to build everything from logic. And this is this idea that you can start from bottom up and build things on top and then recreate the whole world from these basic principles by just kind of uh, covering things from a little, uh, not for a little, from a huge uh, root and building up, yeah? So they wanted to establish a transparent, unified system of foundations. They, they think that this can be achieved. On the other side, we have people like Bull, Derek, and Hilbert. I would call them algebraists. based And they thought of abstraction as an instrument to create internally coherent frameworks. So they use these frameworks to model, to establish a theory, but they never require it to, to, to stem from a single unified basis. So they simply are happy that it is disconnected, that it, it is consistent in its own way. It doesn't need to be connected to the roots in a way. It's, it's in the air. It's flying. It's not rooted. And this is, these two tensions are still there. So, so it's very uncomfortable for the left side, for the people who have the left side attitude, to think that we have no roots. Very uncomfortable. And uh, this tentatively set up distinction that, that, I, that I'm going to force throughout the whole uh, pr presentation. I think it's very also consistent to describe uh, 19th century and the early 20th century. And I think it very well explains what happened with architectural modeling. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail here, but the most notable effort to establish this consistency was called Hilbert's program. He used formal systems uh, to, to do that. And he defined three expectations of what needs to happen to formal systems, how we need to develop them in order to have consistency 
in order to basically prove the validity of any theory that you can ever imagine. And these were the three, uh, three kind of main expectations. And then obviously everyone on the left side that, that expected things to work from the roots, they were putting a lot of hope in that this will work, especially like Bert, Bertrand Russell with his work Principia Mathematica, which was 1,000 pages, actually more. Uh, it was like a foundational book about mathematics where on the page 600, he proves that one plus one is two. It took 600 pages to prove that of theory, yeah? So, because the problem was that there were always things that do not want to fit in this schema of roots, simply do not want to fit, and they were called uh, paradoxes. Yeah, so I don't want to go too far and too detailed, but it's, it's, the paradox comes and just breaks apart the whole structure, and then you start from again, and then they start again and again from, from the very beginning, hoping that they will get it right. Okay. So then another earthquake happens as, as soon as it was kind of thought that this can be done. In 1931, uh, Kurt Gödel exposed the fundamental limitation of, of this whole approach. And he showed that these two first, uh, this, these two, two ideas, consistency and completeness cannot be achieved. And especially cannot be achieved at the same time. Yeah? You can achieve a little bit of one or the other under certain circumstances, but together they, they cannot work. Yeah? And then the final punch came from Alan Turing and Alonso Church, who were dealing with this thing called the decision problem. It is basically to, to have an algorithm which can do this thing that I was just saying, to, to, telling about, a formal procedure. And they proved that this doesn't work as well. So none of these things work. Um, by doing so, so it is an interesting thing, by doing so, they created the first theoretical models of computation with the Turing, this was a Turing machine, and uh, with uh, the church, it was called Lambda Calculus. However, because of this link to this Hilbert's program, this thing on the, on, the, on the left side, the meaning, the complete idea and meaning of computation became very much colored by the, by the ideas of logicists. It became kind of, because it was about it was about uh, the Hilbert's program. Therefore, it was really much, very much colored by that. Everyone was thinking that somehow computation is about these things. It's about these formal systems and stuff like that. And then from that, we have two streams that evolved from a logistic tradition. And they all kind of claim their own what computation is about. For example, Wiener, he says, it has long been clear to me that the modern ultra rapid computing machine was in principle an ideal center nervous system to an apparatus for automatic control. So Wiener establishes the same computations about control. And then you have Chomsky on the other side, who says, who gives an example of two sentences, colorless green ideas sleep curiously, or, and furiously sleep, idea, uh, furiously sleep ideas green colorless, says both are kind of nonsensical, but only one is grammatical. So then this side says computation is about rules. One, the left one says it's about control. The right one says it's about rules. And my hypothesis is that all the prominent examples of computational modeling in architecture subscribe to either left or right side. So I would position them, therefore, within the logistics tradition. Computer graphics, they developed soon after the computers were invented, slowly, to provide a certain notion of speciality within computers, but they were limited to the simulation of a Euclidean paradigm, because this was, this was the idea, just to recreate this world before the 19th century, where these geometries axioms were considered absolute truth. It's just recreating that world, world for very pragmatic purposes, yeah? And architecture being very impatient and not having much else on the computer front, simply embraced this and settled into this certainty, into this intuition, into this pre-19th century world, locked itself into it. And the abstractness of the mathematics that is used to actually implement these things yeah, is only uh, utilized as technical means to simulate what was already there prior to 19th century these 2D and 3D objects immersed in Euclidean space. Therefore, I would also position computer graphics within the tradition of logicism. 
But CAD systems are not the only ones that pertain to logicism. I would argue that most of the computational models in the last 50 years subscribe to either the legacy of Wiener, which is control, and the legacy of Chomsky, which is rules. So we have recursive and grammatical as rule-based models. We have adaptive as control-based. We have emergent cellular as rule-based. We have uh, parametric as control-based. If you think about what are grasshopper sliders, they are instruments of control. You have rule-based models like logical, like Christopher Alexander, where you have generative models as control-based. But then what happened uh, to the right side, to this, to this algebraist uh, approach? What did they do? Well, they embraced probability, first of all. And we have three events. I want to go through them, 18th century expected value, 19th century variation from expected value, 20th century Markov, which is dependent variables. And Markov then made a nice experiment with uh, Evgeny Onegin uh, Pushkin's uh, poem, where he was thinking, what, uh, what is the probability between certain characters following each other and stuff like that? And everyone was thinking, OK, that's nice, but this is completely useless. Until 20th century, when this became the cornerstone of search for our planet. This became the basis of Google search engine, which was based on something called the Markov chain and completely changed our world, this one little schema. OK, so probabilistic is on the right. Needless to say that quantum theory entirely uh, depends on probabilistic thinking. As Feynman says, nature permits us to calculate only probabilities, yet science has not collapsed. So science has found in the 20th century new stability within the probability space. With, so science is OK with not knowing. However, there was another shift that needs to happen. This is what I started. Euclid was a certain uh, idea about space. Then you have Descartes. Um, I don't want to go into detail, but in order to have like this new physics, this space on the, uh, in the center and the left, they were not adequate to think about uh, to think about novel physics. They could not. They could host thermodynamics. They could host physics. Uh, Mechanics, yeah, but cannot host relativity theory, yeah. So in 1854, algebraist, who is, for example, Riemann, his theory separated the notions of what we know as topological and metric structure of space and basically allowed for new things to happen. Unfortunately, in architectural modeling, we use Riemann, we use topology, only to reinforce our commitment to Euclid and Descartes. So we use it to go left. So on the left, we have Romanian uh, Euclidean Cartesian paradigm. <coughs> and on the right, we have the legacy of Riemann, which has, goes to the distinctions what is global and local and connections between them, like what Carla showed with the her diagram, and surfaces and covering spaces, which I cannot cover today. Finally, we come to artificial intelligence and machine learning. And AI models, they are of algebraic nature. They do not rely on any intuitive notion of space. They are not confined to the number of spatial dimensions. They do not aim to mimic objective reality, although it's easy to encapsulate it. It is a calculus and linear algebra-based infrastructure which is devised to support an interplay of probabilities, which are always directed towards a particular question. And in doing that, dissolving notions such as reasoning and truth. So with a data set large enough for every question, machine learning provides more or less probable answer, and everything will be objectified universal in the same way, everything. My hypothesis is that the architectural modeling remained within the logicist paradigm because it remained truthful to our intuitions embedded in a simulation of a three-dimensional world. And this hinders our ability to understand and to embrace the generality and abstractness of AI, because they don't all live in the same space. They are conceptually different things. They have nothing to do with each other. So what I would like to talk about today, this uh, sad title, which is just a warning, it's not a predicament. 
So what happens when we collapse these two things, these two, these two very important distinctions? What happens if we erase the line, yeah? If we just take everything as is, if we are just happy, oh, this is new AI, I'm just gonna be playful and I'm gonna just make nice things. <laughs> Don't tell us it's bad, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what happens if we take AI, which belongs to the right side, as a tool, as a tool to help the paradigm on the left? So when we use AI to recreate a world that is truthful to our empirical understanding of things and their foundations. So the story of Narcissus is a good metaphor, I think, for this shortcut. So Narcissus, as you know, is distinguished for his beauty. He ended up falling so much uh, in love uh, with his own image in the reflection that in attempts to even get closer to, to that beauty, he drowned in the river. So where are we in this picture? So we are the Narcissus and AI is the river. Uh, yeah, so we look into the river and we, we are in love with what we see coming back. So if we look at it with our senses, with our ears, with our eyes, rather than with our minds, there is a very seductive image, very seductive sound answering back to us. Yeah, that's you. So we fall in love with this reflection. It's beautiful and we fall in love. And this is how we draw. So if we really believe that what AI is showing us back is ourselves, then we will trust it to delegate our responsibility to it. So we then say, yes, this is us, therefore, we give it the tasks that, is, that are difficult to us to do, that are very responsible, and, and I feel bad to be responsible about difficult things, therefore AI can do it because, because it's, it's like me. So we trust AI to tell us who should go to jail or sh who shouldn't get a loan, and AI will be very helpful. It will tell you with 95% accuracy who is a criminal, and sometimes it will get it right. Yeah? And then we hear loudly that the problem is this thing that you're looking at in the screen is that our data and our bias models are biased. So experts come there loud and say, you should remove the bias. You should remove the bias. We should make AI fair. And this, they don't understand that this is the same story that happened in the 19th century. So they want to be purgers of, of, of things. They want to clear things. They want to make fair eyes, which will make perfect decision. This is the same story as those guys wanting things to come from the roots without, without uh, uh, inconsistencies. So they think that it can be done, that this is possible, that this world ad will adopt itself to meet our expectations. They think that fair AI is possible. It's the same way that logicists believe they can build a world from, from one foundation. And it's the same thing, and people are not, not understanding that this will not work. This cannot work, yeah? So, uh, yeah, it's the same thing what happened in the 19th century with logicists and algebraists. They try to purge the paradoxes, we try to purge the bias, yeah? But they failed, and we should learn from their failure, I think. I think my, my, my I always say, and no one likes to hear it, that when there is, a bias, it is not a problem of data and it's not a problem of the model. It's, the problem, it's, it's you who is a problem, who, who is doing something wrong, yeah? It's you who, who, are, who, is, who is delegating your responsibility, which is something very important, something that we need to be as a society involved with, you're delegating to a machine. So that's the problem, it's not a problem of bias. bias the bias means that I, likes, that I have a better taste than you or you have better taste than me. Bias is a good thing. If you see a bias, a problem, it's probably, it's not, that's not the problem is that you shouldn't be doing this in the first place. Yeah, you should not do this. That's the problem. It's not the problem that is biased. Of course it's biased, but that's not what it is about. So how do I think about AI and creativity? And my current position is as long as we are able to keep this distinction, yeah, between us and this, mirror image that is projected back to us, if we are 
if we don't trust that this is us, I think we are fine. But this is what I'm also worried about. How do we, how do we teach that? How do we teach, how do we, when you see something in the mirror and it looks like you, how do you say it's not you? How do you say, yeah, good, you're very good, but I don't trust you. How do we do that? It's getting increasingly difficult to do that, yeah? So let's then for just fun, explore some phenomena that we can observe with AI and creativity. So what is exciting, what everyone is now excited about, and what, what is so cool that they cannot believe that this possible is. Wow, this is now the first time we see it, yeah? So let's check Twitter. So this was four months ago, uh, Kowloon City in the style of Wes Anderson. It's a facade image resembling a uh, demolished uh, city of Kowloon with the colors that look like Wes Anderson. And yeah, it does not portray a real space. Uh, the Chinese is not really Chinese, I think. Uh, yeah, but it looks believable. Another tweet from the 6th of May named the rise of uh, consciousness by Gerard Dottori, oil on canvas. As you might imagine, Gerard Dottori did not do this. He died in 1977. Or this one uh, is, says, uh, uh, hyper detailed sacred geometry render of a pastel wave on a glyphic mecha angel sculpture, blah, blah, blah. clip guided diffusion. And clip guided diffusion is an AI based data driven generative model that does this, produces the images. And it now it became a kind of growing art form which started relatively recently. So it looks better than, than, style, than, than, than the, the things we saw before. And now everyone is excited about this is art. And yeah, so how, what, how do we make sense of this? Yeah, so the images are detailed. They uh, have a consistent color palette. They look realistic, high resolution. But the interesting thing is that uh, the text which describes it. So the text is not a caption which is describing the image. The, the, the text is what makes the image. So the image is created from the text prompt. Yeah? You provide the model with text and you get the output, you get the image. Uh, of course, it doesn't work well all the time, but it can be very playful because then you can start and playing and see what happens with your cre creative abilities as a, as a text writer. And I have nothing against that. You, you should be played for, yeah? Uh, some of the images a uh, few days ago very much look like architectural renderings, especially if you start from an image which uh, you've seen before. Some examples from Mario Klingelman. He did not include the textual prompt that created the images. One more. So completely computer generated, very believable. And also you can find this uh, kind of generative art on self-hosted galleries. This is uh, often then associated with NFTs, this uh, fungible tokens, cryptocurrency trading, stuff like that. And this is uh, owned by Christine, uh, Catherine Cross, and she's an AI researcher and artist known as uh, River Have Wings. She's kind of prominent. She creates the model, her models herself. And she has her own style, and it's, yeah, this is uh, her gallery. And the question is, what I would like to, so yeah, we see it, we are fascinated, but how do we talk about this? And and it's important to like you cannot just talk about this. Uh, there are things that that you, we need to know uh, prior to talking about it. That's my problem. I do not know how to communicate this because. There's a special way how, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's go come to that later. I'll try to ask, but to answer, not to answer, to raise four questions. What am I looking at? How do we get here? How do these challenges and where to go from here? First part is asking, uh, what am I looking at? So first of all, as a thought experiment, is this an image? And if yes, in what sense is this an image? Because image used to be, for thousands of years, something which is continuous in nature, something that you could zoom in forever and always find details, always find new things hidden there. So a digital image is discrete, has a hard limit imposed on it on that, on that uh, side. And it involves, as Adil likes to say, a uh, suspension of disbelief. So the game is that we pretend that the image on our computer is the same thing as something that can be seen outside of a computer. We pretend it's like that. So what really helps is resolution. 
So the greater the resolution is, the easier it is for us to buy into the trick. And eventually, we just buy into the trick and we don't even care about the pixels. It's just, that's it. So every digital image on the other side is nothing but a long list of values projected into a grid. And yeah, every LED screen is just a bunch of, is also a grid and a printer is a grid and everything is a grid and you just fill the values. And that's how we live today, yeah? So we live in a, to live in a digital world means to live in a discrete world where the numerical value, where a number is a so-called irreducible invariant, eventually mapping to voltage, yeah? Voltage, no voltage, or yeah, five volts, 10 volts, whatever. So here we have a 28 by 28 pixels image, which has 784 pixels. And we can also ask what are the values there. So each pixel is defined by a single value representing the brightness. Brightness is encoded from zero to 55 or higher you want to encode it. Um, and then the screen, when the screen gets these numbers, it knows that this, how to display it on the screen or the printer knows how to print it. And we can invert it and then we got, you know, just change the numbers, switch them, you get something else. So these are the conventions now that we, how do we play the digital? So the thing which is important is that the notion of interpretation within digital is in a no way rash, uh, it's not no way natural. There's nothing rooted into this convention. It's just a convention. It's, we make it how we want it, yeah? It's completely arbitrary. And it, our whole world depends on these completely arbitrary things. And we are fine. Yeah? So what kind of interpretation does machine learning bring to this picture? So in machine learning to encode this image, we need to encode it as a vector, as a matrix or a tensor, which just kind of structures which are a bit bigger than a list, like extends the list in another dimension and another dimension. Yeah? Uh, in the simple case, we can, uh, we can, we can store this image uh, in the same way how it is stored in the computer's memory, which we can just flatten it into a very long list, going from top to bottom, left to right, again, convention, whatever you choose, just stick with it. Uh, but what is peculiar about machine learning is that we interpret the pixels as dimensions. So each pixel of a digital image can be treated as a unique dimension of its image space. So when I say image space, I mean the grid of variables where each variable can have any value between zero and 255. So the grid of numerical values is a general approximator of any image. Any image can go there, yeah? And the approximation quality, of course, depends on the resolution of this grid. So in this case, the grid has 784 dimensions and the digit five is a single point in 784 dimensional space. So this, the, 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 the image that we saw of the five is a single point in 784 dimensional space. Okay, so what is now big data and data in general? So now let's say that we have a typical scenario where we do not work with one image, but with one million images, yeah? This means that we have a distribution of different pixel values because even every different picture has different pixel values. So we have distribution of these pixel values across all 784 dimensions. Therefore, each one of them is variable. It's like, imagine you have 784 certain sliders, yeah? And each of the, for each image, then slider configuration is different. So what does this bring? Then you have 1 million of different slider configurations. This creates a certain shape, just like there is a shape in 2D, which is called a normal distribution, or in 3D, which is also called a normal distribution in, in a higher dimensional space. There is a shape in 780 dimensional space. There is a shape in any dimensional space. Yeah? There is a shape that you cannot reproduce, that you can, you can reproduce, that you cannot visualize. It's not, you cannot see it, yeah? but it's there. You can visualize any of its two dimensions or three dimensions, but all the rest are hidden. Yeah, you cannot do more. Okay, so I got excited, sorry. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Here we have X and Y as dimensions. Here we only have X as dimensions. And this, if you have 784 picture, uh, dimensions, this means 784. Uh, numbers and this has a shape. Therefore, this shape exists somewhere. You can imagine that it ex exists somewhere. And uh, all of our images have shape, have one shape. You do not know, you just can say this, but you cannot see what you say. So 
This is what, what, what we are missing. You can say it, but you cannot see what you're saying at all. But you can really say it and, and, and you know that you're correct about that. Yeah? That's, that's something that we are missing today. So it exists, but you cannot see it. You can, or you can say it. Okay. So the most important thing that I think that, that to take away from this is that, uh, that images that we humans consider to be meaningful or make sense form a very peculiar spatial distribution in the space of all possible images. So the space of all possible images of a specific resolution is incredibly, incredibly huge. It's larger than the number of, of atoms in the universe. So what we humans perceive as familiar, as meaningful, as sensible, just takes a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of this enormous space. If you do not believe me, try making a random pixels and see how often you get anything meaningful out of that. Most of the time, you will just get white noise. White noise is what you get if you just randomly do it. And this is the basis of cryptography. The whole idea of cryptography is this idea that if you just have space large enough and, and sample randomly from it, you can hide anything in it. Anything is there. You can hide. It's, it's gone forever. Yeah. Therefore, but there is a shape which pertains to us humans in this huge space, which, which we like which we find familiar, which we have seen, which, we, which has to do with how our eyes develop, how everything around develops, how the chemical elements in this planet develop. Everything has this thing, yeah? So uh, then the idea of this AI-driven generative models is that they allow us to use actual images like photographs, scans, like drawings, to derive a distribution of points in the space of all images that is very similar to distribution of images that makes sense to us. So they can recreate this shape, yeah? So how are they doing that? They do it by uh, starting from a random distribution of points in space and images. So start by random and then gradually minimize its distance to the actual distribution, which is found in this 1 million images, for example, yeah? And this obviously requires a neural net network, which is just a very large model. Uh, continuous nonlinear differentiable function, which has millions of parameters. And what is the parameters? This is kind of called a free variable. So think that that can vary, yeah? So John von Neumann in the 60s said, mathematician gave him a talk, was thinking about a certain model. And he says, my model had, has four variables. And John von Neumann said, if you give me four variables, I can recreate an elephant for you with four variables. If you give me one more var variable, I can make it wiggle its tail. Yeah, so five variables gives you an enormous freedom. And here we have one million of them, of them easily, or, or 100 million of them. And we are able to match it to a distribution, which is in the data, because we also have million images easily on, on a laptop, yeah? Uh, of course, this, there are many computational tricks here, but we architects should not care about these tricks. This is not our business. The only crucial concept that you should understand here is how this minimization is happening. And this is done through the concept of derivative. We use derivative to, minim to make two things come close to each other. And if you have a large enough model with large, large enough uh, number of uh, uh, parameters, you can make anything what you want. Anything. Anything is possible. Yeah, so when you see this image, you should know that this image is engineered to appeal to you. It's engineered to appeal to you. So the space of images that somehow make sense to your visual perception is very small, and the researchers now know how to approximate it. Yeah? And when you have this shape, you can then sample things from it, take points from this space, and all of them are going to somehow make sense, and you do not know why it makes sense. You don't know how is, it, how is it doing that. How does this now make sense to me? Yeah? In this pile of noise. And obviously because this recreated distribution is not actually identical to, to the one that we are used to, then we see these mismatches, these flaws, these little fluctuations. And then we are even more excited when we see that because we like that. We are, wow, this looks like Francis Bacon. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, and then it's alien and it's nice and we are excited and we are very happy. 
So how we get there, I'm not going to go very far. I'm just going to go very close. Like I'm going to go to 2014 only. 2014 is this image on the right. It's again. And how it looked like in, a, in only 2004, it looked like crap. And now in 2022, you can say to this uh, uh, DALI 2 model, prompt an astronaut riding a horse in a photorealistic style, and you get this, this image, yeah? <laughs> this is how long, 2004 to 2022. Yeah, less than two decades. And we have 100 papers on machine learning every day published. And we have insane amount of money going there. And smart people like to, to be engaged with that. Yeah, so you cannot follow the development. It's like you simply cannot follow these things. Therefore, you should not learn the details. Yeah, in, because in six months, you, there will be a better model. And it actually happened to me because a similar lecture I gave in Innsbruck, and already today, there's a better model. Yeah, it's crazy. So we need to be opportunistic. And uh, yeah, so the GAN, you know the GAN, everyone knows the GAN. It's adversarial learning. You have discriminator and generator, and then they play. It's a very complicated model, very inefficient, and then it creates these things. And then we have this super light model on the right called the diffusion, which actually makes these pictures, um, which is a very simple model. And it, it rests on an idea that if you just add normally distributed noise to any picture and add it in succession one after another, 100 times, millions of times, you will have a unique noise at the end. So any picture, you add randomness to it in millions of stages, and you have something unique at the end in the noise, yeah? Noise that is very different from each other. So it's a very, very important uh, idea that, that, uh, that emerged. So what they do then, they take an image, they add a little bit of noise. So X0 is an image. X1 is an image with a little tiny bit of no noise, tiny bit. And then uh, X1 is a tiny bit of noise, and then X2 has a a next level of noise on X1. But what they do is they learn, uh, given a noisy picture, how to predict picture which has less noise. So given X1, how to predict X0, which is not that hard because there is very little noise. Yeah, And also it's not that hard because noise can be described very simply uh, as a normal, normal distribution, which is just a simple formula. Like it's a super simple two parameter thing. Yeah, covariance matrix and the mean. Yeah, in, in, in as many dimensions that you have. And that's it. So you predict a couple of numbers from X1 to X2. Then you predict from X2 from X1, predict from X3 from X blah, blah. And then you get a Z, which is completely uh, noisy. And then you just reverse it. You start from the noise and you play the model backwards and you get some kind of, you start from random noise and you get something meaningful back on X0, yeah? Okay. And this is how, how it goes. So it starts from random and then from noise and just give that something like that. This is from YouTube, Nerdy Rodent, YouTube video. <laughs> this is how, how just diffusion works. Yeah? Very simple trick. It cannot be simple. So the models got better, get got simpler. When they got simple, this means they're better. Okay. This is still not the state of the art. Okay, now we have a better, simpler model. And uh, how is that this done with these images? That you have a text prompt and it creates an image. Well, just you have another model, which is another neural network called CLIP. And a CLIP is a uh, kind of model which correlates images and texts. I don't want to go into detail. So you give it as an input, uh, an image and a caption. And this is very, to train it, yeah? And this is readily available on the internet because any picture that you will see on the internet, someone will, will write something below it. You know, when you go to Instagram, you make some kind of text. So you just take that, yeah? And say, this text, I assume, describes this image well. And it can describe it in a completely uh, imaginary way. You, you, you're, you don't want to purge anything. You take it as is, yeah? You take all the crazy things about this image and take millions and just train the model, yeah? So how it works, you then give, uh, so it's a little bit different. You give model uh, to evaluate it. You give it a you give it a picture, and you give it a number of texts. So the texts are not there. You need to write the text, and then it just tells you which text of those that you gave it is most probable. So this is most probably a photo of guacamole, a type of food. 
Yeah, but this doesn't is this is not a label. This a photo of no, is not food. This is something that you write. You so I can write whatever, and it will just tell me the probability of how well whatever I wrote corresponds to this image. Yeah? Okay. So this is so now we need to combine these two models. So how do you actually make the, the generations? We just connect these two models. You take a noisy image, you plug it into this clip model together with a caption. Yeah. Noisy image and caption, and then clip tells you the measure of how well they connect, which is not good because it's like it starts from random. You have a noise and you have a caption describing it, and it's not good. But then, because it's a neural network, you can always reverse the question. You say, you ask the clip model, which is just a neural network, what kind of gradient values would make it better? Yeah? What kind of gradient values would make it better? And then you and then the neural network obviously can compute what kind of things would make it closer, yeah? And you take that and attach it uh, to, the, to the noise, concatenate them, just make it into one large list, and then plug them into a diffusion model to predict a sharp image. So the overall idea is given a noisy image and a clip gradient, we ask the diffusion model to predict the sharp image. And this is done in many, many layers at the same time. So when the learning is finished, you can now start by giving the model just pure noise and a label uh, and a caption. And in several iterations, you end up with an image which matches the caption very well. For example, this is a surrealist dream or dreamlike oil painting by Salvador Dali of a cat playing checkers. And this is literally made from this. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it works. And and we it's it's hard not to be fascinated that this works. No. <laughs> That's what I'm saying about this mirror. How is this possible, you know? So we know how to do it, and the model is simple. Yeah, it's simple. And still, it gives you this. So this is what, what the, the, the tr trouble, it troubles me, how to, how to then teach it. Yeah, because it's very easy to take this, to naturalize this very easily, yeah? Okay, so how does this challenge us? So the actual dynamics of this art scene AI generative art scene. On one side, you have these competitive AI researchers, and they create the models, and they work with companies that have unlimited money, like Google, Facebook, NVIDIA, OpenAI. And they, these companies can afford to collect and label an enormous amount of data. For example, Tesla has one, one and a half thousand people who manually label big things, do the most boring job on the planet that needs to be gamified. Uh, and, uh, yeah, some of them also have a monopoly on images like Facebook. They have just take your images to train their models. Yeah, no problem. You upload, they say, thank you. Yeah, and they have an incredible computing infrastructure to do these uh, things efficiently. And you as a person have nothing of that, yeah? So you simply don't have the data and don't have a computing power. So what do we do then? Because we are creative. So then our authors then provide us with a trained model and they give us the code to explore what they train for us. And then these artists, they provide a textual input. They start maybe with a certain image and, and then they are playful with the text. And then the model gives an artwork and they publish it and they hope, hopefully sell it for NTFs and they earn some money. So the role of this artist is literally to sift through a vast data space and try to find something attractive, yeah? And if they are successful, if they know how to curate, if they know how to brand themselves, yeah, they are paid for this. Yeah. But what they do is simply they curate something that someone else did and something that they, in principle, have no access to. Yeah. So the source of value is to have a good taste and to know how to curate, to have a good marketing, and then you have a persona wraps it, which wraps it up, and then this is a generative art scene, and this is what is popular today. But for architects, this is very, way too simple. So architecture is not about only about images, but it's about orchestrating things that have different spatial and temporal natures. So the crucial problem then with automatic generation of any kind is that the model has the final say. There is no policy, there is no politics. Um, we have limited intentionality, limited directionality because your whole universe is created by those who trained the model and selected the data. So what you will find there is essentially determined by the data. You only are given the means to explore it. So 
Those models, they give us maps, which are huge, but they're inherently closed. They do not contain any future architecture. And the sheer size that we are also very happy about and, and impressed about gives us an illusion of openness, that this is a vast like new continent. Yeah? And the question is, who compiled this data set? What is in it? What is not in it? Who decides about it? Because it would be great if I could decide what is in my model and in my data, and then I can tune it, and then I can make my own things. Yeah, But I cannot do it. Yeah? I can only explore what, uh, what these guys gave us. So we do not have the means. And my concern is not about the biases. As I told you, biases are a problem on a different scale than it's talked about. And I'm not even complaining about the, the, the safety that someone will use these models to, you know, fake uh, some political things and whatever, and someone's voice and to steal their identity. I'm concerned, but I'm concerned more about that these models offer a big, these big technological companies, they gave us, they gave them a basis for a very good business model because they don't have to study for five years. They don't have to do internships. They don't have to care about it. They don't have to write about it. They don't have to discuss it the whole night with their friends and get drunk and talk about architecture. They don't have to create a public discourse. They don't have to, 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 to love it. Yeah, they can just do it automatically. Yeah. Yet, this what comes out will has will have in terms of fidelity the as the same quality of output in terms of fidelity not in terms of anything else yeah it will look as if we put many hours into it manual yeah so what what i fear is that that this might become economically attractive to try like to have your likes and your subscriptions and your friends and then to try to kind of determine according to your Instagram posts what kind of house should be there for you and then offer you this house for like two hundred dollars you know to 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 design it. And that's what I'm afraid of. Yeah. Because you cannot compete with that. Because in this then this this then means what is then architecture? What is then architecture? Yeah. So the last question, this is up to discussion. I don't want to tell you what to do, obviously, because I do not know yet. And I will fall in, yeah, I will, that's my career. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. But I think that we should use AI, AI to make architecture more architecture, not more engineering. Yeah. Because machines can do this optimization better than we all can. Therefore, we should not do it because it's already done. We, you should, we should imagine that this is already done because it will be. Question is, if that's done, what is it up for us to do that? Yeah? Uh, optimization is, is pretty good. Machines are good with that. And uh, now we see that AI is also pretty good with common sense. So it can be common sense as well. And uh, so our, our job is uh, as taken from a very nice video uh, online about why Blender for Architects. Uh, our job is about jointing, contracting, attracting, lighting, texturing, animating, communicating, storytelling, and branding. So what, what gives me hope a little bit, perhaps naively, and the time will tell, is that AI models also fail a lot. You can find a lot of good examples. You can find also a lot of bad ones. For example, the most advanced glide model simply cannot make cars' wheels triangular. You tell it a car with triangular wheels, but you cannot make it because, because it's... It never see, saw them, yeah? yeah it, it doesn't exist in our images because it makes no sense to have that. Therefore, you can't do it, yeah? Uh, what's really happening there is that we are asking the model to predict an outlier, which is a kind of a paradox. You cannot predict an outlier. The whole definition of an outlier is that it cannot be predicted, yeah? This is the black swan thing. This means that there are certain things that are rare that are unpredictable, by nature unpredictable, yeah? So, uh, yeah, what is valuable, what is noble, is also intrinsically rare and does not exist in the data. It's outside of it always. And this is why it cannot be predicted. If you want to know more and about these curves also that, that Carla showed and why, why any future architecture is not in the data set, maybe you watch this video uh, on YouTube about AI mastership if you're interested. 
I'm going to go to this image because uh, this is not uh, AI. This is a very traditional generative model, which is based on rules. And, uh, but this is not in the data set. Yeah. So I think these things, however simple they might be, they are, can produce new things. They are producing things that are not there yet. Although this is a very simple model, but this fits because this is not this when you do even these simple things, when you become masterful, when you when you really become an architect with even this simple model, you then get this. Yeah. And, they, and they, there's no explanation. This is just this is how architecture works. It's just it's there, yeah. And that's what I'm interested in. That that's how we uh, that's the promise, I think. Because these models can produce things that have not never been considered because they're senseless. Yeah. This is uh, my, Michael Hansmeier. He was also our colleague at the chair. He's doing things that you cannot draw by hand or model. This is brought a set of Mozart's uh, opera, The Magic Flute. And uh, so what's happening is a very interesting turn because the most prominent opponents of these, these models were always complaining that the design space was too large and full of nonsense. Yeah, but for me, this this unknown space that we create ourselves that, that is more likely where any master tree will come from than from any data. So uh, maybe that's where I'm, I'm going to go. Yeah, so I'm not offering you. The, I'm just telling you where I'm going to go with AI. Uh, my position is that there is a great promise to embrace abstraction, but it requires a very new literacy. And this came from my PhD thesis. This is my research compass. And I strive to be exploring the notions on the right side of the table, because I believe that the notions on the left that pertain to modernity might be behind us. So I will explore AI, uh, the same AI as everyone else, but from the standpoint on the right, from the thinking that comes from the right side of the table. That's it. Thank you.